multifocality. So first we'll have uh, Dr. Jayanthan who's going to talk to us on multifocal glasses and contact lenses. He's a pediatric ophthalmologist and a refractive surgeon who's very well known in uh, India. Yes, over to you Jayanthan. Uh, thank you Nishan. Thanks for including me in your uh, instruction course. So basically I'll cover the basic part of presbyopia correction, the glasses and the contact lenses. So when it comes to the uh, correction of a presbyopia, we are familiar with the single vision lenses, bifocals and the progressive addition lenses single piece lenses that vary gradually in the surface curvature from the minimum value in the top portion to the maximum value in the lower near portion. It ensures the right dioptric power for every distance, guaranteeing a smooth gives a continuous range of vision and it's comfortable intermediate also. So basically the designs are mono and multi design. We have an asymmetric symmetric pattern and hard and soft designs. Mono design a single design used for all addition powers whether it is 1, 2 or 2.5. So the position of the near vision does not change with change in the near addition power. In a multi design a position for the near vision changes with addition of the power change power change and the near area goes up with increase in addition coming to the symmetric and asymmetric in a symmetric we have the right and left lenses that are identical basically the center point of the distance correspond to the center point of the near what we need to do is we need to slightly rotate the lens so by doing this there will be a lot of distortion on the nasal part so to overcome this, we came up with the asymmetrical progressive addition lenses which incorporates a slight nasal offset of the near zone and has got a separate design for the right and left lenses. And the most recent advancement is the horizontal symmetric where the astigmatic pattern is also actually decentered so that the patient doesn't have an extra uh, distortion when they are reading hard and soft lenses harder design concentrate the astigmatic error that is the blend zone into a smaller area of lens surface thereby expanding the area of perfectly clear vision but at the expense of the level of a higher level of blur and distortion so basically the central reading part will be actually larger and the distortions will also be larger so in a softer design the reading part will be smaller but the peripheral will also be blended so the overall magnitude of blur is actually reduced in these softer designs so the harder design is preferred if the patient is already previously using a hard lens and who do a lot of reading basically when you're sitting and reading it helps a lot because you can't move around because the blur is going to be larger in the harder design for an young presbyo active outdoor profession and professional drivers the soft design is what has been preferred so there are certain, certain clinical markers when it comes to dispensing of uh, progressive edition lenses. Uh, you need to adjust the angle of the temple so that the frame sits squarely on the face. This holds good when you are dispensing and if a patient is unhappy and coming back to you uh, with the progressive lenses. Adjust the temple to achieve 8 to 12 degrees of uh, tilt uh, and make sure the contact with the cheek is avoided. The front of the frame should follow the line of face. The temple length should be adjusted so that it doesn't slide because once it slides then uh, because of change in the vertex distance there will be a reduction in the performance of the progress addition lenses. Adjust the nose pad because uh, minimizing the vertex distance will help the patient read better. Monocular PD fitting height has to be marked so that's one advantage which I usually tell to the patient uh, when they wanted to go for uh, online shopping. Poor candidates, mostly patients who have got uh, motion sickness, who are already sat much satisfied with bifocals, who require high addition uh, ads and uh, vertical muscle imbalance, anisometropia, larger pupils are all poor candidates for a progressive addition lenses. So keep in mind that trying to choose a overall one best lens solution for many patients may not really be a good solution. So it has to be a tailor-made solution. 
a patient satisfaction will always be your moving target and new lenses design will always be coming into the market so remain a lifelong learner in order to stay at the top of your game at the multifocal contact lenses it's an option for people who wants transition from the bifocal to the multifocal uh, multifocal glasses to the contact lenses these type of contact lenses are great for people with active lifestyle who do not want to get chained to their glasses so why presbyopic lenses because when you are wearing a glasses uh, you need to do a lot of head tilting to see the knee up you'll have a restricted field of view uh, of course it's an outward symbol of aging switching glasses for reading distortion optics of the progressive bifocals weight of the spectacles magnification image jump all these are complications of the progressive vision lenses so you you if you need to have a better solution you can go for a presbyopic contact lenses so these are some of the consideration which we need to do when we are going in for a contact lens correction so we need to check for the visual requirement the op- occupational environment of the patient is very very important binocularity and stereops is very important when you are planning for a mono vision the near add required for the patient for their particular work is very important most important is the motivation of the patient to use contact lenses any medication if the patient is on is very important the status of the tears and the tear phlegm lid tension position sensitivity of the cornea is all the anatomical things that we need to look into but and of course coming to the material as such the contact lens material availability of the lens in tint and the cost involved is also a factor to be considered coming the fitting strategies always it is better to go for the disposable lenses have adequate number of disposable lenses to give a trial for the patient at giving a trial has to be for a quite long time it is not just the op thing you can't just give a trial for half an hour and uh, check if the patient is comfortable so extend a trial with more realistic and better feedback would be the motivation for patient to use contact lenses use of trial lenses close to the power required is also very important if the patient requires 1.5 if the trial given is 1 they may not be very comfortable follow manufacturer's fitting suggestions use tinted lenses to assess handling right multifocal contact lenses comes as soft gas permeable and hybrid lenses so hybrid would be preferable because uh, they have the best of both worlds so it will be more comfortable and gives the best results also the options are either bifocal or multifocal in bifocal we have the alternating pattern or the concentric multifocal we have the aspheric and concentric pattern basically bifocal contact lenses have two portions of different power the bifocal contact lenses are available in both rgb and hydrogen designs uh patients who have got a, a eyelid in normal position average or smaller people and motivated patients are favorable else it is unfavorable so basically it comes as a simultaneous or alternate image design simultaneous is that the light from the far near and intermediate enters the eye simultaneously essentially provides a far and near vision together and it doesn't rely on the lens movement so far and near correction zones are both position in front of the people in every direction of the case that's the most important advantage and the brain is allowed to select the image to either focus or ignore so it's either concentric aspheric or diffractive designs concentric is a most commonly used whether it is a bifocal or a multifocal lens it shows a sharp demarcation between the distance and near power it could it comes as either a center near or center distance depending on the occupation of the patient and the zone size would be 3 to 4 mm so since the zone size is fixed the performance depends on the pupil size of the patient aspheric uh, it's a progressive addition type of lenses formed with alternation in the anterior or the posterior curvature so use either the front or back surface aspheric design if the back surface is aspheric then the center would be the uh, distance and if the front is aspheric then the center would be the near design the power uniformly increases or decreases according to the type of uh, so it's not a true bifocal because uh, what happens in as aspheric is it increases the depth of focus of the retina it increases the depth of the field thereby increasing the near range it's an option for the modified mono vision especially when it comes for the uh, severe uh, presbyopes so the advantage is that there's no ghosting because there is no ring involved in this clarity of vision is there for all the distance compared to the other models it's a simplified fitting machine it's something like a, a single vision lenses only used mostly for the office workers as i said the disadvantage is again the pupil dependency diffractive lenses are made of uh, concentric rings uh, basically they are act like a uh, frenal prisms several zones of progressive increasing size are arranged concentrically so they perform well in moderate presbyopes offers higher resolution and sharper images pupil size doesn't matter a lot so it gives a good quality simultaneous vision and is easy to fit 
so the disadvantage is that it works well only in good illumination when the illumination is not good it doesn't work there's a little bit of ghosting and relatively smaller optic zone lead, uh, says that the fitting has to be perfectly well and centered alternating as i said this is a bifocal pattern so it incorporates a reading or a near segment located eccentrically that's inferior it can have and uh, be added superiorly also uh, need to look and alternate through the two separate portion to see either the near or the distance it's not a simultaneous that's why it's called an alternating you can see either the near or the distance the lens moves or the translates and eye so that the vision alternates between distance and near in the down case the lower lid will lift the near segment up towards the people to see clearly so fitting consideration power of the near eye is important size and shape of the near segment is very important stability of the lens fit is very very important right so we'll skip on this contraindication as i said larger people lower lid below or too far from the limbus loose lids poor blinkers high riding lenses poor motivation low ad or all the contraindications so advantage definitely higher ad this is going to work much better with a sharper near and far vision works well if it is very successful and uh, the disadvantage is it take a longer time to adapt because the patient need to get adapted to the use of lenses the comfort is less because of the thicker designs so some clinical uh, examples if the patient has got a smaller people go for a simultaneous vision bifocals if the patient has got a larger people go for the translating design so uh, there are a few uh, unsuccessful uh, situations where the contact lens doesn't suit one is a high myopes the patient with a busy schedule already having a dry eye flatter corneas laxity of the lower lid and higher astigmatism they are not going to be uh, happy with the contact lenses and whenever a patient with uh, uh, unhappy patient walks into you just tell them that light is your friend because most of these contact lenses work well if the illumination is good in case if the illumination is low they may not be very comfortable but with that situation never tell the patient to go for an alternate design or alternate procedure and uh, remember the lenses works well together monocular doesn't work here whether it is a monovision lenses or is it a uh, binocular lenses doesn't matter but make sure you tell the patient that it works only when it is uh, together uh, and fitting multifocal is a process it's not like any other one glasses or something you need to really spend a chat time with the patient both during and after the dispensing if multifocal doesn't suits we have other options which we are going to discuss later in the ic and monovision here the one eye is corrected for distance and the other eye for the near it's not indicated when the patient has got an amblyopia or a reduced contrast stereopsis and if there is a confusion or imbalance vertical muscle imbalance definitely it is not going to be a choice so to conclude i would like to give a small recommendation that if a uh, patient is an emerging presbyop of 2 plus 1 diopter simultaneous vision is the better choice it give full correction in both eyes maybe you can think of a mono vision if the patient is not comfortable mid presbyops of 1.25 to 2 again simultaneous is good Uh, equally translating will be working for the well for the patient if given full correction to both eyes mono vision again if that doesn't suit you can think of a mono vision but for a late presbyopes of more than two diopters always translating is going to be the best option followed by mono vision so the correction of presbyopia is more about selecting the right lens and also the right patient that will provide acceptable vision at all ranges both for the distant near and the intermediate thank you thank you thank you dr jayanthan for the elaborate uh, presentation just one question uh, are you saying all the multifocal contact lenses are pupil dependent if so you have actually illustrated that the center point is for near and you're saying that light is our friend so does that mean that when patient is going out in a bright light and seeing distance should they wear some uh, dark glasses to see more clearly for distance uh, or how does that work that's a nice question because most of the contact lens wearers they'll be more comfortable when they are actually indoors with a bright illumination when they try to move out see the illumination we say that it is when it is bright it works well but it is contrast when you go out in the sun when you are trying to drive definitely they are not going to be very happy so in that they need to really wear uh, you, uv protected glasses that's how the pupil stays at 3 3.5 mm and uh, you get both distance and near when they're driving when they want to look at the dashboard and see the uh, readings definitely the pupil has to be 3 to 3.5 mm but uh, indoors definitely if the lights are bright the pupil doesn't matter much actually so it will be an optimum of 3 to 3.5 mm most of the multifocals work well but only thing is it takes time for the patient to get adjusted to it unlike the glasses which you don't need a training or something 
multifocal contact lenses even the fitting process is late you need to call the patient twice or thrice give a time of two to three days for every trial and once you're comfortable then definitely you can go for exactly. because yep. simultaneously they need to actually try to focus on one image and uh, ignore the other image so that they need to get trained so the motivation is very important here yeah even we do give trials to them to use it for a couple of them and about these aspheric are they trials which are there for the aspheric contact lenses a- a- aspheric contact lenses which you had showed hmm. which has an anterior and the posterior, posterior aspheric, yeah so even for that uh, trial yeah. lenses it's available, available. it was a wonderful talk dr jayanth very elaborate and very clear gave us a lot of information i just have few more things uh, if you can clarify for us do you have any specific brands because these are not very commonly used nowadays but there is a lot of demand can you tell me some specific brands which uh, i use johnson and johnsons okay so that's one because the reason is they give you adequate trial lenses that's whenever you ask for it they'll give it to you and they are open for uh, replacements and okay. if you have a particular uh, doubts or clarifications they ready to come down and then help you there are n number of lenses available but the problem is uh, they'll just dispense it's our headache to actually convince a patient here they have a technical person who can actually help you in fitting and the follow ups also okay. so it works well most of the time for patients and uh, sometimes they say monocular fitting will be better binocular what do you follow like in this uh, fitting you give the patient monocular or binocular very frank it's always bilateral that's always okay. better you can go for a mono vision but in case even after repeated trials if the patient is not working well binocularly then we can think of a monocular but uh, to be very frank if the patient is not comfortable binocularly they will never be comfortable uniocularly it's better to avoid uniocular corrections and same with having a contact lens for distance and using a top of glasses is also not very comfortable so it doesn't work that way so there will be a lot of distortions for the patient so it has to be either a multifocal lenses or you need to go for a progressive edition glasses so combination of two doesn't work and uh, till what astigmatism you prescribe because toric it has there's uh, not yet been launched yeah no? so toric is not launched and uh, toric definitely is not a good choice if the patient has got an astigmatism to one if it rotates the vision is going yes. to be very uh, disturbing for the patient so toric patients we don't give a choice for them it's a purely uh, my first choice would be a patient who's who requires uh, who are active uh, lifestyle who has got an active lifestyle and uh, myopes uh, mild myopes or moderate myopes who needs uh, glasses for uh, reading so they do well and uh, everybody who's between two diopters of hyperopia or myopia they'll be happy higher high op- uh, myopes and hyper they'll definitely be ha- not be happy actually sure thank you so much thank you uh sir i didn't get you actually okay so minus 3 and minus 2 no sir no sir i have never tried uh maybe i have not tried but generally usually in that situation i tell the patient to remove the glasses and read they feel that more comfortable because uh, whatever we said and done unless the stereopsis is not there sir yes sir so definitely so in that situation progressive edition lenses or the choices maybe now the progressive edition lenses has come up so many designs you can actually customize it you can actually customize the design uh, segment size also so you can have a intermediate in the top near yes. uh, followed so you can customize it a lot and the distortions whatever we say is actually lesser nowadays so instead of trying all this for a banker who's got all three vision required to all three nation it's better to sit with them uh, talk to the company get a customized progressive edition lenses and that works well sir actually the company is ready to do it you can even shift the segment also you can try to see that so nikon is doing uh nikon is doing zeiss is doing uh but only thing is like when we have already have a good volume of uh, regular pro- progresses they'll be helping out with this sir. so just for one lens or two lens they may not be very uh, friendly to us that's a problem sir 
Thank you so much, Dr. Jayanthan. Next, we have Dr. Nishant on stage. Dr. Anand Parth, please, on stage. Uh, very good morning to everyone here. So, I'm going to talk about uh, the press biopic lasers. Yes, we had a very detailed discussion by Dr. Jayanthan who had told about uh, the glasses and the contact lenses. So now I go to the next layer where we have already started having press biopic laser correction. Yeah, it is a little uh, um, a difficult topic yeah. which I will try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, uh, as Dr. Jainthan has told about all the possible options in the spectacle contact lenses, I am going to the next topic where we have the surgical correction. They wear surgeries like the conductive keratoplasties which I think has uh, become absolute and there are few corneal implants and intracore as well. What about the dynamic presbyopic corrections? We had the accommodative IOL, the lens refilling, the lensectomy which was lenticular and the scleral procedures we had some scleral expansion devices where we had uh, to make sure that they are trying to read the near visions then came the corneal approaches where we had monovision lasik for a long time then creating a corneal multifocality and the combined approach so we realized that creating multifocality is possible with the laser advances which we have where we call the central presby lasik which is either the supracore or the press B max, the peripheral press by LASIK, which is not done, the la laser blended vision, which is the press beyond. So I am going to talk more about the press B max, which is from the Schwind. So what is monovision? So we know that it's only for the distance for the dominant eye and the other eye we correct up to around 1.5 to 2 diopters to make uh, for the non-dominant eye for them to see near. But what is the disadvantages? Yeah, one of the advantages, I mean disadvantages is the stereopsis is completely lost and uh, anisometry appear more than one diopter. But yes, you do have clear focus. If you counsel the patient and have a good chair time with them preoperatively, you can actually tell them that please do not compare your eyes for distance and near. You see it binocularly, you make sure that you put that lens before the surgery and tell them to get adapted to whatever power they are having and then they get adapted to it. Uh, if you start preoperatively itself and the pupil size doesn't matter for this monovision correction so these are the two types of mode where you have this distance vision is which is for the what the peripheral mode means is that the central is for the distance and the mid periphery is for the near but the central mode where we have something similar to all these multifocal lenses with dr jainthan said is where the central is for near and the mid periphery is for difference uh, the distance and what is the advantage in that it covers a whole range due to different focus for distance intermediate and near and it is also a bilateral procedure but the only thing is it is pupil dependent the main disadvantages are it takes time for adaptation and there is a drastic reduce in contrast sensitivity because we are bending the light in different focus so I'm just showing a highlight of what Supracore was. So it is a uh, central presbyopic LASIK where the cornea is made, the central is for the near addition and then you have the intermediate distance. And presbyon which is by the Zeiss, they call something called the blend zone. So this is also working in terms for uh, the spherical abrasion. They actually create a spherical abrasion to the patient so that the patient has a difference in the focus. And what does the Schwinn does is, the best thing the Schwinn does is, is a bi -aspheric design. So you have a central position for the near and then you have the intermediate and then you have a uh, periphery for the uh, distance so this actually also uses a monovision correction but the central is for near making the patient more myomic in the non-dominant type so uh, as I told you it is a bi aspheric multifocal ablation profile so it is similar to the principle of these multifocal lenses the term bi aspheric refers to the optimization of the central cornea for near and the mid periphery for far for each patient's eye so I'll just show you a small picture what it depicts. So this was actually this uh, symmetric press B max we don't do nowadays. So let us take for instance that this is the distance and this is the near. Long time back they used to keep.
the dominant and the non-dominant eye both make them myopic for around approximately minus 2 and the intermediate for minus 4. But then they realized that the depth of focus was very high. So then what happened is came the micro monovision concept where it was half reduced. So once they reduced and made the distance plano. So in this if you see that the distance is plano and then for near they kept it around minus 1.5. Whereas the non-dominant, if, if you see that the full central near is corrected and there is around minus 0.8 diopters. This minus 0.8 diopters is the most significant because this helps in making the stereopsis possible. From micro monovision what happened? So they brought the hybrid monovision. So then they realized that this also didn't have too much of depth of focus if you see for the near it is for the distance it is 1.5 and for the near it is 0.8 so when they brought in for the hybrid for mono micro mono vision then you see that the depth of focus for distance is around 0.7 and depth of focus for near is around 1.4 so same way they reduced it into half for the dominant and the non-dominant eye to just summarize in terms of a single picture let us take for example there is a patient who is having an addition of plus 1.7 diopters in the micro monovision the dominant eye which is for distance is going to have a full correction whereas the patient is going to be completely corrected and for near it will exactly be the half I mean uh, sorry um, uh, the quarter the quarter of this will be there for near and for the hybrid, the distance is corrected. Let's come out to the non-dominant eye later. So for the distance, it's completely corrected. And it will be half of what we are correcting for near. And the monocular, we know how it works where the distance is left plano. Only the near, we do the correction for monocular vision. So the only difference for the monocular is these are the patients who are not having any distance for myope or hypermetro. The patients who are most comfortable in which we have done is mainly the hypermetropes with presbyopes. So I never do it for myopes with presbyopes because they are always having a good vision for distance and they are always comfortable without glasses for near. And suddenly if you make sure that they are able to read near but you are losing that 6-6 six, six parts for the distance, they are little unhappy. So my preferred patient selection is always hypermetrope with presbyopes and not the early presbyopes who are just come between the age of 40-45. I always go up to 48 or 50 where they at least have an add of approximately around plus 2 diopters or 1.75. When they just start getting one, that means that after around 5-6 years, we will have to recorrect if we are doing it very early stage. So, they have done a study for uh, the micromonovision. I have around 5 years follow-up of these patients who are very comfortable. But the only thing is the counseling and the chair time. One more important thing is, what are the prerequisites? So, my always choice is hyperopes. We do the micromonovision. For emetrope, it is the mono vision correction and for myopes we do the hybrid correction and as you get as we are doing this for the age of nearing around 50 we should always make sure that you evaluate the lens with a detailed fundus examination sometimes undilated it might looks like there are no changes but always talk to the patient that they might require a cataract surgery later on and also as they old, as they age, you should always uh, look at the tear analysis, the mybography and also the internal aberration. Because this can also be a corneal wavefront guided procedure for the press B max. As long as the patient is not having any higher order aberrations, I would not correct them as well. So this is how the mechanism works. There is a static cyclotorsion. You can see that this is the distance eye is the dominant eye so for the right eye we do a presbyopic add of plus 2 this we are going to do the hybrid correction so in the hybrid correction you can actually see that what we are the patient is accepting plus 0.5 with a minus 0.5 cylinder but the target as i said it goes to minus 0.89 so the laser which is going to ablate for the right eye with the left eye being dominant is around plus 1.36 so that we get a target of minus 0.89.
and if you see the dominant i which is, which is for distance we actually just correctly complete the full correction of whatever the patient is accepting but i will show you the profile now which also corrects for the near so this is what the profile it looks like you can see it is exactly how the uh, laser is being done for the right eye which is the non dominant eye at the mid periphery that is at 6.6.42 6 mm you have an ablation of 23 and you have a small correction in the center vis a vis if you go to the other eye you can see that center there's around nine microns which is corrected and in the mid periphery that is at 3.57 there is 20 microns so you can see that it's not only in the center center intermediate and far to summarize it works yes patients are a metro for distance most of the time the most happy patients are high probes and astigmatism correction can be also done completely near vision is pure magic and it does work for pseudophagic patients as well and the final thing after around a year's time the patient is not unhappy with it yes press by max reversal is also possible where we just correct whatever acceptance they are having thank you any question Thank you so much, Dr. Nishant. It was a very detailed presentation with all the examples. So, um, I mm. have a, uh, yes. I will be speaking next, but I have a few, a few questions. Please. So, uh, do you keep updating the machine as and when the, uh, the press by on gets updated? Uh, yeah, so this uh, in Schwinn it is Press B Max. Press okay. B on is the Zeiss one. Right. So what uh, they have, I have not updated for the past seven years. So it is the same module which has been there from the beginning. Because okay. the Schwinn Amaris has brought this. The previous Schwinn did not have this Press B Max. Uh, okay. One of the small things, one was, uh, do you prefer to do it under the flap? or would you Yes, prefer? so that's a good question. My preference is always with the flap. But uh, they have not said it is not possible, just that above two diopters, if they are hypermetrope above two diopters, they are saying that the trans PRK also can be done. Yes, it does work. Uh, we always see uh, questions for the earlier procedures were in terms of regression. So what happens in some patients? So, yeah, so that's what exactly I'm in the five years, maybe in another two years, those patients might come back. But as long as these five years follow up, which I have, None of them have come back with any difficulty or regression. Last question, at least in my experience, I find uh, the tolerabil tolerability where patients don't want to compare the eyes about minus one. Beyond that, if you make them 1.52, mm -hmm. they somehow don't feel there's a significant drop in their patient satisfaction and in vision. So I think minus one, most people are able to tolerate. What is your experience? Exactly, sir. That's why this monovision correction, which is more than minus 1.5, I think patients are not caught tolerating because one, the stereopsis, contrast sensitivity all goes down drastically. Yes, I would also agree with you and keep it. That's why the laser makes the target of 0 0.89 right. diopters. Exactly. Nice question. So that is actually a different part where they say that only negative aspheric lenses we should not use. Apart from that, the calculation is according to the normal protocol like if you put an ICL because it does not change uh, too much because it is only the central part which is going to get flattened. So the calculation for the IOL is also not going to be affected because of the procedure per se. But people ask me, because you've already created a multifocality, what happens when they want a multifocal lenses? Yes, you can post uh, uh, aspheric uh, lenses. It is possible. Just don't put a negative uh, multifocal lenses. Yes, yes, whichever is, I mean, yeah, so always any post LASIK, I always take three calculation. I do an immersion, I do a master, and I also calculate with the ACRS calculator. So I always do these three because I have not, I mean, yeah, I have listened to everything. I have not got a single perfect this thing where I follow these Barrett's. It is 100% sure that post office. So for the benefit, always take three, decide which is the best. And uh, that's what I practice. Uh, I'd like to Thank introduce you. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Preeti Raghavan. A very good morning to uh, one and all present here. 
I thank Dr. Nishant for having me in his instruction course. So a warm welcome to all the delegates who have come early Sunday morning. And um, I'm Dr. Preeti Srinivasa Raghavan, and I'm a senior cataract refractive surgeon based at uh, Dr. Agarwal Eye Hospital, Gachibali in Hyderabad. And today I'm going to speak about a newer um, topic, I would say. Uh, you would have all heard about monofocal ICLs, but what I'm going to talk about are the multifocal ICL. And um, I have no financial interest uh, associated with this uh, topic. And I will be uh, the multifocal uh, phakic IOL. I would like to term it as multifocal phakic IOL because I will be covering two things. I'll be covering the multifocal ICL from the star surgical. And I'll also be mentioning few words about the IPCL plus biopic, which is already available. Both are only posterior chamber uh, implantation phakic IOLs and uh, phakic IOL. Uh, a little bit about the ICL material and advantage before we go into proper multifocal ICL. These are implantable columnar lenses. These are type of uh, posterior chamber faking intraocular lenses by Star Surgical, which was launched in around 1993. They are 100% biocompatible, soft, flexible gel lenses. This patented material is made up of 60% percent poly um, uh, hydroxy ethyl methacrylate, water 36 percentage and benzophenone 3.8 percentage and 0.2 percent collagen and uh, in many studies they have been proven very safe, they have safer alternative to refractive lens exchange also which carries a risk of retinal attachment and loss of accommodation and uh, the faking intraocular lens has been conveniently and conventionally used for high degree of refractive error or when corneal refractive surgery is contraindicated. Uh, reversibility is a main advantage. Uh, no additional space like a LASIK machine which uh, needs or a specific instrumentation is required. Your basic uh, good biometry with a, a decent uh, uh, topographer and uh, uh, hands of a good surgeon. This is a very safe procedure. And currently there is uh, one FDA approved uh, post chamber intraocular lens uh, which is uh, the ICL which is the implantable column lens. This is just to show the various models. Initially, we were having a, a plate haptic lens, which is plano concave, and uh, which has got the directional holes. I will be talking more about this when I talk when I go to the video. The, the next generation and the latest generation has got a sentry port as well, which will help us not have a pre-operative uh, procedure like a peripheral idectomy, but it is still safe. And this is the place where the IOL is uh, placed, that it that is in front of the clear fakic lens and uh, behind the iris in the sulcus. And uh, just a little bit about evolution. Why I am talking about this is because the latest model of multifocal ICL is also based on this. The ICL is a rectangular one piece plate haptic design, which is plano concave. Uh, we, we were using the Visian ICL 4 and it has been commercially available since 2011 to correct myopia. Toric version was approved in 2018 to correct to reduce myopia with astigmatism. Both lenses are available in four lengths. This is important because sizing of ICL is very important. It is 12.1 uh, mm, 12.6, uh, 13.2 and 13.7 and it is around 7.5 to 8 millimeter wide. The uh, V4C which is uh, the C uh, uh, actually denotes the centri port or the EVO model as we say. Features a central port or a hole of 0.36 millimeters. It's called an aqua port. It means to eliminate the need for NDI gyrotomy as I said that was required in patients who had previous model ICLs. The uh, port is meant to allow the physiological aqueous humor circulation. The lens also has an ultraviolet absorbing chromophore. So following the EVO model, which is the V4C, we have the EVO plus. Currently, most of us are using the EVO plus ICL model V5. Uh, this has got a broader optic zone. And, um, and a very recent addition to this, the trials have been completed. Few other countries other than India have uh, started using it. This is uh, EVO Viva. It's based on the same sizing and large optic zone. It has got a large optic zone up to 6.1 uh, millimeter and can be used to correct residual refractive error after cataract surgery as well uh, as a normal 360 micron port in the center of the optic, which as I mentioned, this is for the aqueous flow. And... Um, so, this is uh, this EVO, EVO plus ICL and historic version with both FDA approved in the United States in March 2022. 
and we have a long term published safety uh, results for these icl so with the same platform the multifocal icl is going to come up and we believe that it is going to be very very safe so safety first and then this is an innovative double solution and uh, this is uh, which will this will correct myopia as well as presbyopia the evo viva which is the multifocal icl uh, this is a clinical study which has told about the performance and safety of the extended depth of focus implantable collamer lens this is based on edof platform unlike the icl which is based on the uh, multifocality uh, diffractive platform and uh, the company has not given great details uh, with respect to the designing it has been uh, this is a star evo vision implantable collamer lens with aspheric optic and uh, it is referred to as extended depth of focus implantable collamer lens or the eed of icl and a novel approach to surgical correction of refractive error and pres presbyopia in phakic patients and includes a combination of most advanced elements of icl platform including an increased optic diameter to note the central port ks aqua port and an aspheric design which is theoretically intended to pro provide up to 2d of extended depth of focus basically so the primary performance end point which were analyzed uh, was the achievement of monoocular uncorrected near visual acuity of snellens equivalent 20 by 40 or better at 40 cm 6 months after the implantation and equal to or greater than 75% of the implanted eyes these were the main thing which was uh, um, looked for and um, the indications which is being told is EVO, VIVA, ICL is indicated for phakic patients 21 to 60 years of age or pseudophakic patients 21 years and older with an IAC depth of 2.8 mm or greater to correct per reduce myopia with or without presbyopia because we are going to we can also use it for 21 years of age that's why it is mentioned with or without presbyopia ranging from point, minus 0.5 diopters to minus 20 diopters uh, as as explained, is intended for placement in the posterior chamber. So this is a design. The main point in which I wanted to let you know is for all the ICL users, we know that the markings will be with right side up. So the leading haptic, when it goes inside the eye, you should have the uh, marking in the leading haptic to be on your right side. In the E vivo viva, it will also have a partial hole on the right side near the optic design. So this is the design. Uh, variation which will help us identify what is the lens which is being implanted and um, they were they the studies have also told that there is no decrease in contrast sensitivity and there is a lot of improvement in visual acuity at all distances but because this has been aimed to get the uh, extended depth of focus and a near vision comparison at 40 centimeters it is better if we plan it like how we plan for a normal lead of multifocal ions with a micro monovision correction uh, especially with the myopia in the non-dominant eye so it requires bilateral implantation for a better performance and we can aim a micro monovision with the minus 0.75 at least in the non-dominant eye uh, this is the approved range this is not present for astigmatism and not available for astigmatism above 0.75 uh, diopters as of now and uh, it will be coming up with the same sizes like 12.1 12.6 13.2 and uh, 13.7 with minus 0 0.5 to minus 18 and as said up to plus 2 diopters it will be very comfortable for near. So going on to the preoperative evaluation of this multifocal ICL it's very similar to our normal ICLs which we do. A complete ophthalmic examination including uncorrected distant visual activity and corrected dis distant visual and uh, near vision activity. You have to do a cycloplegic refraction white to white measurements slit lamp biomicroscopy to rule out pre-existing cataract or any other anti-segment pathology an intraocular pressure measurement because we are going to operate and place the eye in the AC so very importantly glaucoma has to be ruled out I generally even do a OCT RNFL baseline documentation and a perimetry for all these patients and corneal evaluation if you are, if you have specular it is good to get the specular done or only in cases of doubts if you have a gut day this has to be definitely done and uh, if there is a compromise uh, the eye uh, is contraindicated and uh, as with other ICLs dilated retinal examination evaluation for presence of retinal tears is, is to be done lens sizing nomograms are available very similar to what we do for the normal star ICL uh, this is basically based on white to white measurement and anterior chamber depth, depth measured from the corneal endothelium to the crystalline lenses so 
uh, the white to white which is actually recommended is from the op scan 2 and uh, the ubm will definitely give a better white to white measurement but ubm is not very freely available everywhere and uh, this vaulting to be measured post operatively the IOL power calculation is performed through the online calculator which is provided by the modified vertex formula as given by the star surgical. So once you send in all your uh, required data, they will be sending you which ICL to implant. This is a small video to just show you the um, So this is mainly to show because we uh, as it is very similar to the ICL always remember this right side up has to be done. This is few pearls for fake ICL. What parameters we have to watch for the loading technique and step by step procedure. Always remember there should be a 2.8 is a cut off ACD and the white to white has to be measured properly. Generally we size it one plus one millimeter to whatever white to white we measure and uh, these are the two ports. These are the uh, leading orientation marks in the leading haptic, uh, it should be on the right side. So I always remember right side up is how it has to be implanted and then that the convexity should be up and then we will have to, uh, these are the axis marker if you are going in for a toric but in multifocal ICLs we don't have a toric. This will be the center flow, uh, additional to that one more port will be available and uh, this is very important with respect to loading. You may have to remove the air bubble because it will be very difficult to wash it later on. And uh, when you pull, you have to always look into the orientation mark and the central marks edge marker. We have, we generally follow this because uh, twisting is very common with respect to ICL. That is one way in which the IP seal is better than the ICL. But long term follow up, I always have a, I have a follow up around 10 years of my cases. I feel ICL is much safer. And always see to the orientation marks. few positions where how would the orientation mark can be on either side. The best is to have it all in the center which means the first the mark, the second trailing mark and the cartridge lock. All these if they are in the center when you load, you load very carefully, pull the, uh, I, pull the ICL with the ICL forceps in such a way that all three are in line. So when you go inside and implant it will be just a single push, always implant on the anterior chamber and then tuck the haptics. Uh, if there is a twist, you will have to pronate or supinate your hand accordingly so that when it unfolds, you don't twist it in the opposite direction. So there are few tricks and tips which will help us uh, do it. So if you feel that the leading haptic is on this other side, you will be having a you will have to rotate it to the right side. So these are just positions. Can uh, so that is about the uh, ICL. Uh, uh, just a few words about the IPCL. This is also available in market since 2015. A lot of people have been using it. And this is based on the diffractive rings as I told before. And uh, this is a case with presbyopic ICL in situ. Few articles regarding uh, with respect to that. These are just the last point, take home points. Patient counseling is to be really mastered because as told in every presbyopic discussion, uh, presbyopic correction discussion, you will have to talk to the patient before you put them up to any point and always remember under promise and over deliver. Always tell the patient not to compare both the eyes. You have to see binocularly. So even when I see the patient, I tell them come and see with both eyes open. And uh, re with respect to multifocal ICL, long term results are uh, awaited. And availability uh, availability in India is still awaited. Probably it will take a year for us to get the multifocal ICL. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Preeti, for this detailed talk. So, uh, yeah, it's an amazing procedure. As she said, her final point always ask the patient to see binocularly. Thank you. I call upon Dr. Anand Padsarathy for our final talk on the multifocal IOL. So, he's a cornea, uh, refractive and an amazing cataract surgeon in Chennai. So, he's done his uh, cornea work from Singapore. So, sir is going to enlighten us, enlighten us with uh, the multifocal IOLs. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of the course. Uh, and 
uh, I think uh, the concept of multifocality between what Jayantan mentioned in contact lenses uh, and what, what, what we find is actually uh, quite nice. Uh, no financial interest, but, but it would be nice to have some. Uh, okay, so there is one uh, patient who I would present with uh, business or government contracts diagnosed to have cataracts in another hospital and wants to read the Bible without glasses. Uh, her children are doctors, son is a clinical trial specialist and he's done intensive research on the different IO, IOLs including me. He's read all my papers published, has a discussion uh, with me on my PCR rates and the number of premium IOL surgeries done and the son discusses the average post-operative results including the confidence intervals. Uh, the daughter wants to observe surgery, uh, so she comes into the OT. Of course, the preoperative preparation included antibiotics and NSAIDs for the patient, uh, but for me, the preparation included prayers to so Vishnu, Shiva, and of course, Jesus. Uh, luckily for both them and me, the surgery went off perfectly, and uh, she did have a history of RK surgery. Uh, the brother also had similar surgeries done, and of course, uh, they didn't tell it, uh, and the amount of refractive error prior to that was almost about minus 12 in both eyes. Uh, and they wanted spectacle free vision. Now, if you can make out an RK surgery when you're looking, uh, you need to make sure that uh, the depth of the RK incisions are correctly looked at. And you need to plan your incisions. Most times you would end up with a scleral rather than a clear corneal incision. Uh, at the end of the day, the management were happy with the income and I was happy with the outcome. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the uncorrected and best corrected, and you can make out in these patients also, you can actually get good vision. So these are post-RK, we did a toric, multifocal toric, they actually did well. Remember, uh, most of these patients are very smart. Most of them are very well read. All of them almost come uh, well read in terms of their uh, requirements. So, but we promise our patients sutureless surgery, we promise our patients spinless surgery, and we re request them for less post-operative time but we need to make sure we are not paid less but more for this these kind of surgeries and perfect surgery is no longer utopian getting good vision six by six post surgery is quite well so i changed the terminology to something called atl or advanced technology lenses and i find that works better it sounds a bit more different from what you would actually call them this is the workflow at our clinic where we have the questionnaire we do have the consultation with the doctor and the optometrist and we of course highlight the 99% success rate for surgery. An ideal patient is of course that uh, you have good visual equity, you can use limbal relaxing if you have access to it and you remember that visual equity is almost always enhanced by bilateral implantations. Now what are the optical principles? Remember that the basic optical principle because light is only 100% in is to create a single elongated focus to enhance the depth of focus. That's how EDOF lenses work. Monofocal is basically a single point. Multifocal may have two or three discrete points. The main determinant of unwanted visual phenomena is the lens design and its optical parameters and that is the basis for which you choose the lens. Remember unfortunately we cannot test drive the IOL with the patient. Uh, and there is a difference between EDOF and multifocal. EDOF available today are basically some of them are really multifocal lenses with a lower near ad power in which the rest of the power has been withdrawn to avoid the overlapping of the images. If you're looking at spherical operations, that's how EDOF works. Uh, there are multiple ways of modifying the central part of the IOL, which is the low ad, or you have small aperture IOLs. Now, this is a slightly busy slide, but I prefer to quantify EDOF lenses as pure EDOF, wherein you're moving along with the spherical aberrations and hybrid, where these, these are basically trifocal with modifications or multifocal with modification. Now, there is some principal mechanism. There needs to be some high order aberrations and this basically improves the depth of focus. Uh, and EDOF lenses, if you look at pure EDOF, the concept is modification of spherical aberrations. Now you look at the FDA data or the EDOF and this is a slide, it's not very clear, but uh, when you're playing around with this, you would lose a bit of contrast if you increase the spherical aberration and that's an important factor. So if you want depth of focus, you will lose contrast sensitivity. And if you look at the package insert of, this is from the VVT, it is very clearly written that these patients will have loss of contrast if you implant these lenses. So this needs to be clearly explained to the patient and the company also accepts that. Now there is a different set of lenses which use a ad just like a contact lens in the lower part of the IOL and 
they also have seem to have good results. The concept is that if you're looking through the lower part, you would see reading. So the pupil tends to move inferiorly and nasally, and that's what gives you the ad. The ad varies from 1.25 to about 3. Now, what are the advantages of EDOF? Basically, the glare and the halos. If you think about a multifocal, you're looking about glare and halos. The amount of glare and halos are said to be photonic phenomena, said to be less with the EDOF lenses. This is an interesting concept where you have a central hole. Uh, and this is something that has now been actually accepted by the acufocus, which were making the press biopic implants. Uh, and of course, the cutting edge is basically the trifocal optic, but these rings is something that are present on the surface of the IOL, which will affect with the light. Uh, epithelial dis uh, disease, I think uh, uh, Nishan touched about it, but remember that a lot of borderline OSDs like this, if you try and put a multifocal IOL, you will struggle with post-op results. Uh, so I prefer to do punctal plugs prior to surgery before I take them off. Just to conclude, there are basically characteristics. So if you're looking at multifocal, you're always going to get better near vision. If you're looking at EDOF, probably distant the Indian media good, which is about 50 to 70 centimeters. Near is not that great. Toric, of course, gives you very good distance vision. And monovision is basically, if you do a bit of mini or minor mo monovision, you will be able to manage reasonably range of distance. Uh, the SRKT, preferable formula, the Hollet A2, if you have access to it. Remember, I prefer to aim for about 0.25 for the first eye and target about 0.5 for the dominant eye. Uh, and post-op evaluation, make sure that you refract them early, preferable to do a retinoscopy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Have you given a combination of EDOF and one, L, uh, one uh, eye and the There is a trend focal. towards that, partly because uh, if you get that multifocality of a plus 3 or plus 4, and then you give them about a plus two or plus one with the spherical abrasion. In fact, there are some patients who I checked are actually quite happy. Okay. Works, works. And you said the dominant, you keep it. Do you do always a dominant eye first? Or uh, the norm, is I there see, uh, dominance, uh, uh, though the concept is well established, I find dominance shifts. There have been studies wherein the dominance shifts. So, um, yes, if you are right handed, you tend to be uh, dominance in the uh, right eye. But dominance uh, in terms of first, really doesn't make a difference, but I prefer to keep it just myopic because you see in a hyperopic, they cannot accommodate for distance and near. So then you are really in trouble. But myope, you can just say that it, once the capsular contraction occurs, there is a bit of hyperopic shift anyway. I think that's a good question. We do get patients sometimes. You have to tell them that distance vision will always be better in the first eye, which is a monofocal eye. You are giving them that spectacle ad inside the eye. So tell them not to compare. Thank you so much for everyone. I hand over to the next session.